lab material here. And we're going to pick up and talk about the skin, the integument, one of our cutaneous membranes. So starting off, if you look at this picture here, this picture here is showing you all the different layers of the skin. Now, mind you, okay, mind you that the skin only has, if you notice here, the integument only has two layers, the epidermis and the dermis. But you'll notice down below here, we added this fella in. That's called the subcutaneous layer. We'll talk about that. That's not part of the skin or the integument system. We just include it here because it's so close in proximity to the integument. Okay, but keep that in mind that that is not part, and I'll go into that in a little bit. So going back to this slide here, there are two layers, the outer surface layer, which is the epidermis, and then the deeper layer, which is called the dermis. Those are the two layers of the integument. So we're gonna start off, and, and when we get into the lecture, we'll, we'll get into more detail, but we're gonna start off talking about the epidermis. And notice that the epidermis is made up of one of your four tissue types. It's made up of epithelial tissue, specifically, it's made up of the keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. So from that um, title there, that name, we can in our minds think, all right, stratified squamous, it's, it's multi-layered and those cells are gonna be flattened cells. Now the epidermis has five layers, excuse me, four to five layers, all right, that are going to be part of the epidermis. We call those strata. And we're gonna start when we go through this, all right, we're gonna start with the deepest layer here, and then we'll finish up with the most superficial layer. And if you remember what I said about the, um, keratin, this, this should remind you, okay? Keratin kills. And that's why we call this epithelium keratinized stratified squamous because the cells all right, in this epithelium create the protein keratin. And it's great because keratin makes the cell strong, strong like bull, makes it tough, makes it resilient, Unfortunately, that process will eventually kill those cells. So these first three layers, all right, in our epidermis, these first three layers, the keratinocytes, which is one of the, uh, of the cell types in the epithelium, they're all living. They'll start, and I'll get into this here in a moment, they start to make the keratin when they reach this layer. And then sadly, they start to die because they're producing the keratin that eventually kills the cell and the cell dies. All right, so let's talk about, I'm gonna leave this up here for the rest of the class. Keratin kills. I'm gonna make a t-shirt that says that. And only science nerds like myself will laugh at it. Okay, so the deepest layer, the stratum basale, that's not how you pronounce it. It's supposed to be stratum basal, but if I keep saying basale, you'll never forget there's an E on the end and you'll put the E there when you're spelling it out because spelling counts on our tests. So the stratum basal, the deepest layer, all right, is one single cell layer. And if we look at it, all right, we'll describe those cells as cuboidal or low columnar. Well, wait a minute, Dr. Kaz, you just said that the epidermis is made up of keratinized stratified squamous epithelium. You're absolutely right, it is. Okay, but remember what we said, when we're going to name the epithelium, if it's stratified, we always name it based on the apical layer. So whatever the cells look like on the apical layer, 
That's what we name the epithelium after when we're talking about the uh, cell shape. So even though they start off in a cuboidal or low columnar type of appearance, they eventually flatten out all right, and turn into squamous. So there's three types of cells that we're going to find in this bottommost layer. Easy to remember because stratum basal begins with the B, so does bottom. All right, so this is the bottommost layer. So we have keratinocytes, that's the predominant cell type. And then we have melanocytes, then we have tactile cells. So the keratinocytes, all right, we're going to find these cells in all of the four to five layers of the epidermis. But in the stratum basal, they're going to start off as stem cells, which means that these cells are constantly regenerating. All right, they're dividing. So one cell will divide and it'll make two cells. And we call those cells daughter cells. And so one of those two daughter cells will stay in the stratum basal to divide again at a given time to make two more cells. The other will migrate into the next superficial layer. So we'll see a lot of division going on here in this layer. All right, these are the cells, like I said, that makes keratin. And its job is going to be to strengthen the epidermis. All right, but in doing so, the cell will die. All right, those are the keratinocytes. The melanocytes, the second type of cell type in the stratum of the cell. All right, these are going to be sprinkled throughout this layer here. All right, and their job is to make and store this awesome pigment called melanin. And melanin is going to be a substance that gives our skin its darker appearance. And it does so when it's exposed to ultraviolet radiation, sunlight. And so these melanocytes, right, have uh, these organelles that make the melanin. And so they like to share melanin. And to do so, they have these structures called melanosomes. And so they'll share their melanin with neighboring keratinocytes. So the melanocytes aren't the only cells that are going to have that cool uh, pigment, right? It's going to share all right, that melanin all right, via the melanosomes with the other keratinocytes in the vicinity. And it, what it does is it helps to shield the nucleus from that ultraviolet radiation. So it gives it almost like a coating around the nucleus because guess what's inside? The DNA. And ultraviolet radiation, all right, if it strikes the DNA, it can cause this process called dimerization. And it basically will split the DNA and that's a bad thing when we're trying to make proteins, right? Or we're trying to replicate cells, right? We just, we don't need to have any complications added to that, to any of those processes. So melanin helps to do that, helps to protect. The third type of cell type in the stratum basal are our tactile cells, also known as Merkel cells. And they're basically these touch cells that when you apply pressure to them and they get compressed, they'll release these chemicals and those chemicals will then stimulate receptors, sensory receptors that will then generate a nerve signal right, to our nervous system carrying sensory in information regarding touch. So those are the three types of cells in the stratum basal. So that's our first and deepest layer. Now, let's come to the second layer, the stratum spinosum. Stratum spinosum is superficial to the stratum basal. So this is where those daughter cells will wind up. And so they'll get pushed into this layer. All right? And at this point now, these cells are going to go out and socialize with one another. They're going to get to meet their neighbors. And so in doing so, all right, they're going to create interactions with one another. Specifically, they're going to create intracellular junctions and desmosomes. And basically, that's just fancy talk for these cells are going to start to 
tightly pack themselves in with one another and create these areas here in which I hate it when that cursor does that. I don't know why it does that. In which it basically prevents things from moving in between the cells. And so that allows protection from pathogens from getting in from the external environment, water, other fluids, anything like that. We're going to see another type of cell in this layer, though. And we would call those epidermal dendritic cells, also known as Langerhans cells. And these cells are really cool, okay, because they're going to be part of our immune response. And you'll get to learn more about them. But they play a role in helping to monitor for skin cancer. If there's any abnormal cell growth going on, they initiate the immune response. Got to nip that right in the bud before it gets out of control. They'll also uh, uh, play a role of uh, what's called an APC, which is an antigen presenting cell. So they'll find uh, an abnormal protein or a protein that it doesn't recognize, and it's gonna show it to an immune cell and basically saying, hey, does this belong here? Do you know this guy or whatever? And if the immune cell says, yeah, that's fine, cool. Uh, if it doesn't be like, nope, that's gotta go. And so it can, again, initiate the immune response. So the third layer is the stratum granosum, gran excuse me, granosum, granulosum. Not very thick, only three to five cell layers thick, all right? But this is where our cells start to kill themselves, all right? So they're starting to fill themselves up with keratin. And by doing so, then that process starts to kill off the organelles, which of course, if you're it's like taking your own organs and starting to destroy them. You can't live very long without your internal organs. Well, the cell, same way, right? And the nucleus, it all starts to go away and disintegrate. And so these cells then, once all that happens, are considered to be dead. They're gone. All right. The next layer is the stratum lucidum. Okay, again, not a very thick layer, but what's important is we only find this type of a layer in thick skin. And see, that's easy to remember because there's only two places in your body where there's thick skin. The palms of your hand, hands, and the soles of your feet or the bottoms of your feet, that's it. So you're only going to find this layer in both of those areas. All right, so keep that in mind. Again, not a very thick layer. All right, it is translucent, relatively clear. So um, only found in thick skin. All right, our stratum corneum, the outermost layer. This is the superficial layer. This is what I see when I'm looking at you and when you're looking at me. This is the layer that we see. This layer is gonna be thicker, about 20 to 30 cell layers, all right? But unfortunately, they're dead because keratin killed them all, right? But they're nice and tight and locked into one another because they started to establish those relationships in the stratum spinosum, all right? So, and because they're dead from the keratin, but what did that keratin do? It strengthened the cells. So they're tough, right? They're a tough guy. And so because of that, th we describe the, this layer as dry and thickened. And those qualities help to protect the underlying layers and tissues from possible infection or damage, all right, mechanical stress, all right, to the lower layers. So here you can kind of see, all right, we have our actual, actual light microscope uh, slide version here of all the layers. You can, it's tough to see, but way down here, there's the stratum basal. Then all of this kind of purplish, this is all the stratum spinosum. We'll get into this dark purple over here. That's the stratum granulosum. You can barely see it, but then which makes sense because we're in thick skin and this is the translucent layer. 
This is the, the stratum lucidum right above that stratum granulosum. And then all of this, all right, all of this is that stratum corneum. So this is thick skin because this is several, 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 several cell layers thick here. You can see here are three different types of cells in the stratum spin, uh, 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 basal. Okay, melanocyte, here's our Merkel cell, and then all these other guys are the keratinocytes. Here's one of our AP, or our dendritic cells right here. Okay, so a couple things that I want to discuss when I'm talking about the epidermis, right? Some of the things that you'll notice that, that you probably have already noticed, right, are some of the variations that we see. Um, not only in the thickness, which I'll talk, which I talked about already, I'll talk about here in a little bit more, but obviously skin color, all right, and then some of the uh, skin markings that you might notice that are on, on, on some folks' um, uh, epidermis. So thick versus thin skin, real simple, all right, palms of the feet, excuse me, palms of the hands and the soles of the feet are where we're going to find the thick skin. It's also going to have all five layers. All right. It's going to contain sweat glands, but guess what? No hair follicles, which makes sense. Look at the palms of your hands. Shouldn't be any hair growing on there. Look at the soles of your feet. Shouldn't be any hair. So there's no hair follicles or sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands are associated with hair. So if you have hair follicles, you'll have sebaceous glands. If you don't have hair follicles, you will not have sebaceous glands. So you can't have sebaceous glands without hair follicles. So then where's the thin skin? Everywhere else where there is not thick skin. So most of your body, but keep in mind, no stratum lucidum is present. But of course we do have sweat glands because you experience that when it's 95 degrees outside and you're walking around, there's sweat pouring down the back of your neck, down your face, on your arms, all right? That's all thin skin. Also, look at your hands, not your hands, excuse me, look at your arms. You might notice that there's some hair on your arms. Well, therefore, you have hair follicles there. And if you have hair follicles there, then you have sebaceous glands. Sebaceous glands, and we'll talk about that, um, the sebaceous glands uh, create a thicker type of um, secretion is called sebum. It's more of like an oily viscous. And so you'll see like sometimes you'll notice that, hey, that person over there has got some greasy looking hair. Well, that's from all the sebum that's on their uh, hair that the sebaceous glands have produced. So here you can see two microscopic slides, right, showing the difference between thick and thin skin. Look at that stratum corneum on the left compared to the right. Okay, look how thick that is. It's huge. So you notice the difference there. All right, skin color. All right, again, some of the things that are going to influence our skin color are going to be hemoglobin, melanin, which I talked about, and carotene, which I'll talk about in a second here. Okay, hemoglobin right, is that protein that carries oxygen in our red blood cells. And so if hemoglobin is oxygenated, it'll give the appearance of red coloring to the blood, All right? That's why if you notice whenever you cut yourself and the blood is always gonna be red, that's because it's exposed to the oxygen in the air. Well, so if you notice when some folks that are, are particular uh, fair skin or light skin, if they're in a very hot environment or if they're exercising, you might notice that their face becomes flushed, it turns red. And that's because of the increased blood flow to those areas there. All right, melanin, that is that substance, mentioned it before, that the melanocytes make, okay? And it, it, its um, production is um, determined by one, genes, okay? Depending on mom and dad, all right, that is going to determine, right, your, the genes that you inherited will determine how much melanin you're producing. Also, when you step out into the sun, right, as the ultraviolet radiation is striking your skin, right, the melanocytes will produce melanin. All of us have the same number of melanocytes, 
I'm not saying the exact same number, like not everybody has 1.5 billion, okay? But pretty much have the same number of melanocytes, but some folks' melanocytes are much more active than others. I, for example, my melanocytes aren't very active. So I'm light skinned. In fact, you would describe me as being quite pale. And if you were to see me in person, I might blind you with my whiteness when the sun comes out because again, my melanocytes aren't hooking me up with melanin, right? So we'll see that in certain people, they don't have any melanin production going on. And so the condition of albinoism is one of those situations in which the melanocytes are there, they're just not making melanin. And so that is an issue. The last substance is carotene. Okay, you may have heard of, you may have heard of beta carotene or carotene, right? which is this pigment that is in significant amounts in carrots, for example. And it's what gives carrots the orange coloration, believe it or not. Um, it's a relatively safe biological uh, component that you can use in certain products. For example, uh, spray tans. Um, folks that go in and get a spray tan, uh, they, uh, you'll see that the keratin is, is, a, is a large ingredient in that because it's safe and it can help to color the skin. Now, it depends on where you go. If you go to a bad place for a spray tan, and I worked with this guy when I was in my Red Lobster days, many, many years ago, uh, in which this guy looked like an Oompa Loompa. And if you've ever seen the movie, Willy Wonka and the Chocolate Factory, um, Willy Wonka's helpers and partners over there at the factory, he had these guys that had orange skin. I think their hair was green or purple. Uh, but this guy looked like a six foot four Oompa Loompa. Um, and he just went to a place where they had quite a bit of that keratin in that spray tan solution. So here you can see a picture of the melanocyte production of melanin and how it basically just goes and shares it with the neighboring cells here through the melanosomes. So the melanocyte produces the melanin, right? And then shares it with the surrounding keratinocytes here and gives that melanin to those cells to surround and coat the nuclei to protect their DNA. It's really kind of a cool process. All right, another type of variation that we'll see on the epidermis are going to be the skin markings. And here's just a couple um, uh, more popular ones. The mole or the nevus, right? The nevus is gonna be a benign growth of, mel of melanocytes. Now, I always caution folks, if you are uh, regularly and frequently exposed to uh, sunlight, all right, and you have a significant number of, of, of nevi or moles, you should get those checked quite regularly because those benign growths can become malignant growths. Um, and then that's when you have to worry about cancer. Um, another type of skin marking, freckles. I'm one of those people that has uh, these freckles. It's just localized areas, which really kind of frustrates me because, all right, Certain parts of my epidermis is doing quite okay in uh, production of melanin, but other parts apparently just can't be bothered. So you'll have these scattered areas throughout on the arms, legs, face, usually, again, areas that are exposed to the sun of just localized melanocyte activity. And mangiomas, all right, again, this is a, another type of tumor. It's a blood vessel tumor. Thank goodness it's benign, all right? But you'll see these uh, usually around the head uh, in some areas on the face, okay, in which you'll have some discoloration of the skin, uh, but more so of a red tint because of the increased blood flow in that area. The last one are friction ridges. What the heck are those? Those are fingerprints. And actually, in between the two layers of your skin, the epidermis, the outer layer, and then the deeper layer, the dermis, right? you have this interaction. I'll show you better here in a moment, all right? But where those two layers come together, you'll have these uh, bumps and ridges, all right, depressions. And um, the, we call those friction ridges, but that's what gives us our fingerprints. 
and everybody's uh, fingerprints are unique to one to to themselves. All right, that brings me to the second layer of our skin, the integument, and that's the dermis. This is the deeper layer. All right, so in this layer, it's pretty much made up of all right connective tissue proper, and you remember what connective tissue proper is. All right, that can, that is the first type of connective tissue. There's three types of connective tissue: connective tissue proper, supporting connective tissue, and fluid connective tissue. So we'll have our connective tissue in this layer, and look at all the other things that we'll also see in this layer. And this is why when I tell folks about the dermis, I tell them this is the layer where you find all the stuff. All right, the epidermis is pretty much epithelial tissue. All right. That's interesting, okay? But the dermis is where you have all four types of tissue present. That means epithelial tissue pre is present there, connective tissue is present there, muscle tissue, and nervous tissue. So if you look at the list here, blood vessels, well, there's epithelial tissue and blood vessels. Sweat glands, again, that's epithelial tissue. Sebaceous glands, again, epithelial tissue. Hair follicles, nail roots, sensory nerve, that's nervous tissue, all right? And then we have erector pili, that is smooth muscle. So we'll see all of these different types of tissues present in the dermis. So our dermis is made up of two layers. Um, the papillary layer, which is the smaller, thinner layer, which is more superficial. And then the reticular layer, which is the deeper layer. That's the larger of the two layers, all right? So pretty much the predominant tissue type in the papillary layer is going to be loose connective tissue, the areolar connective tissue. But we'll notice in the papillary uh, layer, all right, we'll have these bumps, these projections that go up. All right, and we give them a name. And we call those the dermal papillae. Now, if you notice in between two of these bumps, you have this thing right here, this kind of depression, all right? And that depression is the uh, um, epidermis, which we just talked about, all right? So we call those the epidermal ridges. And so they kind of create this locking mechanism between the epidermis and the dermis. But it's in this area here, I got a better picture, all right, it's between these two structures, the epidermal ridges, and you can see how they're projecting down. <clears throat> you can see how they're projecting downwards and they'll fit in between the dermal papillae, All right? Well, anyways, these and these are the reason for these. So the relationship or their interlocking or, or the interaction between the epidermal, uh, uh, the epidermal ridges there and the uh, dermal papillae create our fingerprints. So then our reticular layer is the bigger layer, which is deep to the papillary layer. All right, this is where we're going to see another type of connective tissue proper which is our dense irregular connective tissue. That's the predominant. There's so much of this tissue in the dermis that if you were asked a question on a test and it asked for the predominant type of tissue in the dermis, all right, it would be dense irregular connective tissue because the dermis, uh, the um, reticular layer is bigger and thicker than the papillary layer. Even though the predominant connective tissue in the papillary layer is the areolar connective tissue, all right, the dense irregular connective tissue in the reticular layer is way more. And dense irregular connective tissue is nice because there's a little bit more ground substance. And if we have more ground substance, then guess what? We have more room for blood vessels so we can get some vascularity going on. All right, I already showed you this picture. Let's discuss all right, the presence of certain items in our dermis. Now remember, connective tissue proper 
is the predominant tissue in the dermis. Remember, connective tissue is made up of cells, protein fibers, and our ground substance. So the two predominant type of protein fibers found in our skin are collagen and elastic. Well, that's great. What's collagen do? Okay, collagen adds strength and resiliency to whatever type of tissue that it's in. All right, so that's good. And then elastic fibers are wonderful for stretch and recoil. So in the dermis, we have these bundles of these types of fi protein fibers, and we lay them down parallel to one another. So we have to know the directions of which these parallel bundles of collagen and elastic fibers are going. Because one, it helps us to determine, all right, the best direction for certain types of stresses on those tissues. But what happens if we have to cut into the tissue? We have to make a surgical incision into our skin. And we're working on a movie star. And this movie star makes $20 million a year on their face alone. And we can't leave a big scar there. So we need to know where these fibers, all right, run. Do they go north, south, up and down, or east, west, side to side? Because if we make an incision that's perpendicular, all right, to these bundles, like this way, then we'll leave a scar. But if we make an incision that's parallel here, then we will have less scar tissue because that tissue is able to heal quickly, which is good. So anyways, the orientation of these parallel fibers, we call those lines of cleavage. And so that's where we can see the tension, all right, in the skin here. I'm gonna show you a funky picture here in a moment. But in certain situations, you know, if that skin gets stretched beyond its capability or capacity to resist that stretch, then we're gonna get what so many of us call stretch marks, right? But what we call them is striae. And that's what happens when we've surpassed the resiliency of those collagen fibers. They get torn. Unfortunately, that happens. You'll see it in folks that have gained a lot of weight, then lost a lot of weight, uh, weightlifters uh, that have bulked up quite a bit, okay? Um, uh, women that have given birth, and after the birth, once they have uh, um, um, lost the weight from pregnancy too, they might have stretch marks on their abdomen, all right? It's just because some of the collagen there was torn. So here's this uh, picture showing us these lines of cleavage, these tension lines. All right, so you want to avoid an incision that's perpendicular to those lines of cleavage. That can leave a scar. We want to make it parallel. If it's parallel, then we're able to leave less of a scar. It heals quicker. and um, it works out for the best. Okay, that's it for the integument, but I'm gonna talk here about the subcutaneous layer for a moment, all right? We also call this layer the hypodermis or superficial fascia. I hear it referred to more as the hypodermis than I do than superficial fascia, but this is a great true false question, all right? This layer is not part of the integument. Never was, never will be. It just sits below the integument or deep to the integument. The two types of connective tissue that are present are areolar connective tissue and adipose connective tissue. Both of those are loose connective tissue. Loose connective tissue has lots of ground substance. So guess what? That means that we have lots of blood vessels, which is good. Because if there's lots of blood vessels, then it's a great place to inject drugs into people because then we can get it into the bloodstream quicker. And so if you recall, right, when we were talking about adipose tissue, adipose tissue or fat tissue, lipids, right, their functions are going to be energy storage or triglycerides, right, protection or cushioning 
All right, we can pack this type of tissue around certain organs and also insulation, right, from hot and cold extremes. So the subcutaneous layer, all right, keep in mind, once again, is not part of the integument. All right, we're going to review this in lecture, or we're going to go over this again in lecture, but just real quick here, talking about the functions of the integument, all right? One, protection, okay? Our skin is our first barrier of defense, all right? When you talk about the immune system, you're going to learn about the innate immune system, and this is part of the innate immune system. It's a barrier that keeps out harmful substances, microbes, all right? It also will protect us from injury if you brush by something, all right? I'm not saying it's particularly sharp or whatnot, but if your skin wasn't there, well, what's below your skin besides the subcutaneous layer? Skeletal muscle. So it protects injury from the skeletal muscle, all right? It also helps to do some temperature regulation. We talked about that in chapter one with thermal regulation, right? What happens when you get too hot or too cold? If you get too hot, you increase the blood flow to the surface of the skin to give off that heat, all right? The opposite happens when you're cold and it helps to protect, all right, from the harmful effects of the sun. The nice thing about the skin is, and, and, is that, all right, in addition to the protection, it helps to play a, a, a preventative role in the loss or gain of water. Now, this is important because the epidermis, the outermost layer, all right, is water resistant. It's not waterproof. And as a result of that, try laying in your tub for an hour. Get out of the tub, look at your hands, all right? They're all wrinkly and pruney. You've heard that term. Well, eventually water has found its way in, okay? So those um, interlocking mechanisms that your epidermis, that those keratinocytes have established aren't completely uh, waterproof, all right? They can keep out a lot of the water, Right, but they can't keep out all of it. And so again, it also helps with water loss when you're sweating or when you're undergoing what's called transpiration, which is when your sweat glands just give off little puffs uh, uh, of, of, of sweat right, every once in a while. But there is water loss from that. We're gonna talk about metabolic regulation right, in more detail in chapter seven, when we talk about the bones, all right? But your skin, you know, all these people will go to these vitamin supplement places and get vitamin D supplements and, and spend quite a bit of money when you can get plenty of vitamin D for free by just being outside. And if you're outside, right, I tell, excuse me, I tell folks, um, Roughly, you want to have about anywhere from a half an hour to 45 minutes of straight sun exposure to the majority of your skin. Now, what does that mean? Okay, well, it means that you cannot have any type of sunblock on because that will prevent this from happening. And you can't be wearing a, a hoodie uh, uh, that has long sleeves on it in jeans where only your face and your hands are exposed to the sun. That's not that much. What I'm talking about is like a tank top, shorts, all right? You're not wearing a hat where at least 50% of your body is exposed. And I'm not saying stand out there, all right, for 30 to 60 minutes, just letting the sun blast you. I can't do that, all right? But if you're able to get out there several times a day, you know, 10 to 15 to 20 minutes of straight sun exposure to the majority of your skin, you will um, produce enough vitamin D, okay, which will eventually turn into this fella, which is called calcitriol. And that is going to be, all right, a hormone that is going to increase, all right, your blood calcium levels. This hormone gets released when your blood calcium levels are low. And so what it does is it prevents your kidneys from excreting calcium and phosphate in your urine. And it also helps to release stored calcium in your bones to go into your blood. More on that in later chapter. All right, secretion absorption is another function all right, of the integument. Okay, so the secretion portion, that comes from sweating. 
right? The other absorption uh, function comes from, perfect example, nicotine patches, right? Nicotine patches are transdermal patches that when you stick onto your skin, all right, the skin is going to allow the passage of certain chemicals to be absorbed, all right? So therefore, we can actually say our skin is selectively permeable. It's going to allow certain drugs or chemicals to um, um, permeate into our uh, uh, blood vessels, and it's going to block others. All right. Immune function, I mentioned it before, it's part of the innate immune system where it just creates a physical barrier, but also we talked about those dendritic cells that live in the epidermis, <clears throat> and we'll also have some white blood cells or, or, or immune cells in the dermis that will initiate the immune response if they come across any um, pathogens. Temperature regulation, right? Mentioned that before, okay? So when we want to increase blood flow to the skin to release heat from our blood, all right, the blood vessels are going to undergo what we call vasodilation. That means they'll get bigger. And when they get bigger, more blood can flow to that area. Well, when you're cold, all right, we want to move the blood away from the surface of your skin because we want to conserve heat. So those blood vessels in your skin will undergo what's called vasoconstriction. And those blood vessels become really small, making it really difficult for blood to move through. So we shunt that blood, that nice, warm, beautiful blood to the internal organs to keep them warm and keep them safe. And then we have our sensory reception, okay? A majority of your sensory receptors are in the skin. And so that's how we're able to detect external stimuli is through these receptors, okay? So we'll go over a lot of those, uh, those receptors, where they are um, later on. All right, so this is a good place to stop with the lab lecture portion. I want you to bust out your lab atlas and let us get into, um, Let's get into labeling the lab atlas here. All right, let me pull up my other slideshow here. All right, and before I, that's great. This was annoying me the other night. It was clicking. All right, that should be good now. Yay, okay. So there's only, when I say a couple slides, I think there's like 28 slides, 25 slides for the integument. Okay, so we're just gonna run through those real quick, give our brains a rest here. All right, so this model is showing us, all right, the epidermis, obviously, but if you notice, all right, we, we're seeing the two types of variations in the thickness of the epidermis. To our, the left of our screen, we'll see the thin skin. And we know that it's thin skin because, well, it's, it's a thinner epidermis, but also you can see some hair, that little thing right over here, that's a hair, okay? And we know that hair is present in thin skin. And then over here in the center of our screen, this is where our thick skin is. You can see the huge difference between the outer layer of the epidermis, the stratum corneum, and this part compared to this part. We also see this white line here. Now in your lab atlas, it might look like it's yellow. Okay, it's gonna be the same thing. I don't know why it's like that, but it's a printing thing, All right? But this represents that one layer that's present in the uh, thick skin, but not present in the thin skin, which we'll talk about here in a moment. All right, so there's our outermost superficial layer. That's the stratum corneum, all right? All the cells there are dead. All the keratinocytes are dead, all right? Deep to that in our thick skin is our stratum lucidum. This layer is present only in thick skin. Be aware, you might be asked a question about that on your test. So that is the thick skin 
um, layer. Just deep to that is the stratum granulosum. This is the layer in which the keratinocytes start to produce the keratin. All right, it's only about three to five cell layers thick. It's not huge. And then right below that is the stratum spinosum. This is where the, one of those daughter cells just moved into this layer and now it's gonna start to form that interlocking, those tight adhesions in between the cells there. And so we'll find our dendritic cells or the Langerhans immune cells there. And then finally, the lowest layer, excuse me, the deepest layer is the stratum basal. One cell layer thick, three different cell types present there, the melanocytes, all right, our Merkel cells, which are the tactile cells, and then the predominant cell type, the keratinocytes. All right, so those are the five strata in the epidermis, which is the outer layer of the skin. Okay, so the deeper layer is the dermis here. Remember, this is the layer where all the stuff is located. Okay, so you can see it's, 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 it's significantly bigger and thicker than the epidermis. So the dermis is made up of two layers. We've got the papillary layer, which is indicated right there. All right, and that's gonna be the more superficial portion. And then we have our reticular layer, which is right below it. That's gonna be the thicker layer. And that's where we're gonna find a bunch of stuff there. All right, so you can see here on our model, those little bumps there, those are the dermal papillae. And so in, in the dermal papillae, we have structures. You might have some of these sensory receptors here. We'll talk about those in a second. You could have blood vessels. Because remember, one of the care, I haven't talked to you about this, so you can't remember because I haven't told you this. All right, one of the characteristics of epithelial tissue is that it's avascular. That means in epithelial tissue, you will not find blood vessels. And if you look on our model there, there are no blood vessels in this tissue. But there are blood vessels down here in this layer, in the papillary layer. And so they'll be in these papillary, these dermal papillae here. And so how these cells get their nutrients and get rid of waste is through that process, process that I talked to you folks about tonight of diffusion. So they can diffuse into and out of the blood vessels there. So that's what we're seeing, all right, where all those blood vessels are that you can see here in our circle, that's called the papillary plexus. And then below our dermis, is the hypodermis or the subcutaneous layer. And there's only two types of connective tissue in that layer, areolar connective tissue and adipose connective tissue. And that's what you see there. Our adipose connective tissue are those yellowish little um, clumps, it's your fat. But look at all those blood vessels that you see in and around the area. Here's some, here's some, a lot of blood vessels. All right, you don't have this in your book, but this is just pointing to that, um, that receptor I was telling you about, the Meisner's corpuscle. It's also known as a tactile corpuscle. And this is in the papillary layer, right? And those dermal papillae is there. This is just showing you, you can have both. You can have uh, sensory receptors and blood vessels all in that area there. So that's the Meisner's corpuscle. I'll show you uh, uh, what it looks like on the model in your book there. And then you can see you have this structure here. This is called a free nerve ending. All right, and the free nerve endings are gonna be found, all right, in the epidermis nearby. All right, that is, these free nerve endings, they transmit sensory information, particularly sensory information of pain. Here's your Meisner's corpuscle or the tactile corpuscle on that model that you have in your atlas there. All right, and then you have another type of uh, sensory receptor, and that's called the Pacinian corpuscle, also known as the lamellated corpuscle. It looks like an onion, so it's like an ogre. It's got layers here. 
All right, so it's deeper. So this is going to sense deeper pressure or vibration that's further down. All right, here it is, the only muscle that you are responsible for, okay, in the skin, the erector pili muscle. It's a smooth muscle. And this is the muscle that gives you goosebumps because what it'll do is it'll contract and it'll pull the hair. This is the hair and then the structure that surrounds the hair is called the hair follicle. and the erector pili muscles attached to the hair follicle. Okay, one of the structures that we have in the skin are gonna be glands. And so this gland, this is a type of gland, and we'll talk more about it um, when we get into tissues here. All right, this is the apocrine gland. Apocrine glands, all right, are going to be associated with hair. This is the apocrine gland. So the next type of gland that you're gonna see are gonna be the merocrine glands. And these are your common sweat glands. So when these things are active, this is the, these are the glands that are mainly responsible right, for the water dripping down your face when it's hot outside. And, and uh, if that sweat gets into your mouth, it tastes salty, well, that's because of this gland here. That's the merocrine gland. So they're not associated with hair. So you'll find them all over the place, okay? Palms of your hands, soles of your feet, on your back, on top of your head, on your face. All right? These glands are everywhere. And then the third type of gland is called the sebaceous glands. You can see that this gland is closely associated with hair and it, surrounds this hair follicle and it produces an oily viscous secretion which is like an oily coat and it covers your hair it helps to nourish and protect the hair but also it acts as a bacterial cidal agent it'll prevent uh certain bacteria all right from uh it, it will damage that uh bacteria okay so you notice that that arrow is pointing at that structure there and it's labeled a hair shaft. Simple rule, if it's above the surface of the skin, it's called a hair shaft. I repeat, if it's above the surface of the skin, it's called a hair shaft. If it's below the surface of the skin, we call it a hair root. Hair shaft above, hair root below. Root of a tree, in the ground. Trunk of a tree, above the ground. Then at the bottom of the hair roots where it starts to kind of expand out, we call that the hair bulb. That's gonna be the beginning of our hair. So everything in that circle is part of the hair bulb. And then you can see these little blood vessels going into all right, the center bottom portion of the hair bulb, and that's called the hair papillae. And then the region right above the hair papillae is called the hair matrix. That's the actively growing portion of your hair. Those cells are dividing, and as they divide, all right, the cells get pushed towards the surface of the skin. That's why your hair grows outwards. That's the hair matrix. All that's down there by the hair bulb. Then you've got the outer covering to your hair. We call that the hair follicle. So like think of the hair follicle like pants. Your leg is the hair and the hair follicle are the pants that go over your leg. All right, that's the hair follicle, the outer coating. Here you can see it with the arrow pointing, okay? That's where the muscle is attached to. 
And that's where the sebaceous gland wraps around. That's the hair follicle. And that's it. That's it for the skin. All done with the skin. Say the skin, not a lot of structures. I will be sending out uh, the Quizlets. I do believe I will be sending that out tonight. Uh, 